Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. When the center of the storm is not one Alberta team, but two Alberta teams are the center of drama in the National Hockey League. Thus, it is so dramatic that we need two separate podcasts to cover this. Welcome to yep. the crossover edition of the Shifts and Pucks and Fireside Chat Part 2. I'm Kevin from Shifts and Pucks. You can follow us at Shifts and Pucks, uh, Facebook.com Shifts and Pucks, YouTube.com Shifts and Pucks, uh, Twitch.com Shifts and Pucks, subscribe wherever you got your audio as well. And we are here crossing over with Fireside Chat. Hello, Matt from Fireside Chat. How are you today? Oh, good. Uh, the Flames and Oilers certainly aren't, but, you know, I'm doing all right. That's good. Uh, it's good you are doing all right. And we will, we've got a lot of ground to cover. We will have some dramatic entrances, it sounds like. We may get a dramatic entrance from Dan. We may get a dramatic entrance from Devin. Who knows might, might dramatically enter this chat, um, of course, uh, Matt, just to tell everyone that doesn't know about Fireside Chat where to find you first. We'll do the we'll do this at the end again as well. But yeah, uh, on all the same platforms as you at FiresideChat.ca and uh, our uh, website's FiresideChat.ca. Fair enough. Good. Um, so this is basically you're going to get the same episode on Shifts and Pucks and Fireside Chat. So we're live now on, on the Shifts and Pucks stream, and this will be uploaded onto the Fireside Chat st- stream. But let's go through the week, and we will start with the game on Tuesday against the Nashville Predators. It was every game with the Flames this week had a little bit of some spice to drama, and it started on Tuesday. The Flames were down 2 to nothing to the Nashville Predators, and about with about three four minutes left in the uh, second period jonathan huberto was moved to, to from left wing to bench door opener and remained in that position for the remainder of the game um with a long forlorn lost love look in his eyes and uh, but the Flames came back. They scored three. They scored four in the third, led really by Blake Coleman, who overall might have been the best Flame over one of the better Flames this week with a four-two win over the Predators. Dan, let, I guess just before we get into the Huberto specific part of this, what were your thoughts on the game? Well, even though in the first period, I thought the Flames played adequately. Um, and we're kind of, I thought, a little unfortunate to be down to nothing. I did not think that Nashville had a ton of uh, chances in the first period. It just so happened that the ones that they did have, they capitalized on. And by and large, I thought the Flames just controlled the play throughout the contest and eventually were able to break through uh, as the game went on and late in the second with Dylan Dubé scoring and then uh, two in quick succession early in the third to take the lead and just went on from there. Yeah, I I mean, they didn't play bad in the second or the first part of me and, you know, kind of grinded their way through and they found a way a little to, and to kind of come back base, you know, they did this in Seattle and, uh, they did this later in the week as well, where they were able to kind of kick get their legs. And um, yeah, they had a little bit more effort and jam than they have early in the season, uh, where especially the depth guys and the new young rookie guys uh, were stepping up in this contest and showing more as the game went on. And that was what led to Huberdeau getting benched because he was particularly struggling in the second period and everybody else was kind of going at full cylinder yeah he he's he was yeah i would agree that he uh, well i mean obviously everybody would agree that he was certainly struggling and it's been a struggle since he's been here for the most part and he yeah he could he just didn't seem right he couldn't get a pass going and um it were you surprised that he was benched? 
No, and it's one of those things that, it, it, by and large, it's... Uh, this is going to sound weird. It's not really Huberto's fault that he's struggling. He just does not fit with the Flames' way of generating offense. Because, um, hearkening back to when he was with the Florida Panthers, he was very much an east-west player and would require his line mates to crash the net to create space for passing lanes, and he would find people whether it was the trailing defenseman or the guys crashing the net, he would find those guys. But with the Flames having a very north-south way of attacking, there's no time and space for him to actually make any creative passes. And it it just... It, basically, the Flames system is systematically designed in a way to hamper Huberdeau from generating anything. And it's hard for him to adapt because that's how he's played his entire career rather effectively. And yet, you know, it's just not working. I, yeah, I can see that. I thought Chris Tana made a, or it was Chris Tana that I was, has been credited with this quote on Elliot Friedman's 32 Thoughts, where he said that Huberdo, with Huberdo, the problem is, is he hasn't figured out the Western Conference yet. It's an interesting comment. Because, I mean, you do see a lot of players from the Eastern Conference struggle when they enter the Western Conference because it is a different style of play overall when you're playing that way. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's in part where Huberto is – like, I, I've said this before. I'll say it again. I still think Jonathan Huberto is a good hockey player. I don't think that this – Yeah, is- same here. I still think he's a player that's capable of being the $10 million player. It's just having to figure out – some way of getting it to work within the system that the flames have yeah and yeah and he doesn't unfortunately part of the problem is is he's not working with any of the centermen uh who who the flames have which is whether it that be backland lindholm or cadre and i don't know if they've really tried him with backland but i mean it's not i don't think a little bit last year but not much yeah but he certainly doesn't work with Kadri and I, I think Lindholm and Huberto are trying to find some chemistry, but it just clearly isn't working. And, you know, uh, just to go on a little bit of a tangent here. And I think just as we head into the, the week here, here, we, okay, we maybe, maybe let's go to the, let's talk about the Toronto game first. Cause I think that yeah. this will illustrate where I agree. Going. Um, so it was a the Leafs jumped out to a four one lead, and the Flames battled their way back. And the gay, you know, Mitch Marner in the shootout loses the puck, regains the puck, and scores. And the Leafs come away with a five four win, which with a one of the it was a fun hockey game uh, to watch. And but um, the Flames don't come away with two points; they come away with one. Uh, but just in terms of that game. That was Elias Lindholm's best game in a while. And the reason I bring this up into connection with Huberdeau is um, part of Huberdeau's problem, and I love Elias Lindholm, but he, I, you know, I can't say that he's had a great year. He's gone nine games without a goal. I, um, uh, um, and he, there is, in the auto, we'll get to his play in the auto game, but he, he certainly looked he looked good in this Leafs game. He had a lot of chances, um, but that was probably one of his better games. And that really, in terms of where I thought Huberto had, in terms of a response, I thought he had a pretty solid game overall against the, the Leafs. Anyway, that line... Yeah, a lot I agree. And frankly, if Lindholm had any finish in him in that contest, he might have got a hat trick. Yep. It... it like there was at least five or six chances that Huberto set him up for a tap in and for whatever reason it just didn't work and it, you know and I think that's been systematic with Huberto is that like he does actually get those great eight chances for the other team players on his line but it just uh you know they're not ready for it or they're not anticipating that he's gonna fire the pass off like in the overtime, uh, he Huberto had a clear line to the net, and he passed it over to Lindholm. And if Lindholm was expecting the pass, 
Like, that was an easy, just lift it up over the pad and you've won the game. But Lindholm was not anticipating that Huberto was going to fire the pass over to him, which, you know, like, if you've seen any of Huberto from when he was with Florida, you know that that pass was coming because, you know, but it's, yeah. And, you know, unfortunately, that the end result was that the Flames lost. And, you know, it's frustrating. And, like, you know, a game like that for Huberto, like, I'm sure that, you know, like, he, he had a statement game in that one that, like, hey, I am actually doing what I can. And then his line mates let him down, and he goes pointless in the game. Yeah. Uh, he had an assist in that game, I thought. Yeah, he oh. did. Oh, okay, he did have an assist. I, yeah. Yeah. My mistake. Um, but for like the other uh, there, before we get to the elephant in the room, there was another story in that game. And it was really because before the week, the on Wednesday, the flames called up Dustin Wolf uh, because to uh, from the Wranglers, there was and a lot of people went, wait, what, what, what's happening? And it turns out that Mark Jacob Markstrom's day to day. So Dan Vladar got the starting goal and I thought he had a tough start, but I thought he battled his way back in the second half and kept, gave, like, um, he cost the Flames a point and gave the Flames a point, if that makes any sense. It's funny, Matt, I think that he um, he struggles at the start. I've always kind of noticed that with him. He doesn't get off to the greatest start. He seems to be battling, he seems to battle the puck, but as the game goes on, he seems to get hit a little bit more comfortable. And that, that Toronto game was an example of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but then we had uh, the, so let's go to after the game. You got, you've heard uh, you've, some pretty positive things out of the locker room from Nazem Kadri, who's, I think, playing a lot better the last couple of weeks. Yeah. And Zeger, who I also think has been playing a lot better the last couple of weeks. Um, and yeah. I think, you know... Well, and you, you look at um, Connor Zari coming up, um, you know, and he's found a home on that line with Kadri and kind of reinvigorated all three of the players on that line, and they've been excellent ever since. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but then this story comes out shortly after the game. Kevin Week breaks the tweet or whatever the we call it now on social media, but Nikita Zadorov has a requested a trade from the Calgary Flames through agent Dan Milstein. Uh, Rick Dollywall from Donnie and Dolly uh, responded that the uh, Vancouver will be one of the teams that will be involved. Pierre Lebrun from TSN confirmed it. And it became the story of that uh, the story of the weekend. And I think we have to kind of stop here and pause and talk about this. Yeah. Um, and I'm gonna start with me. I'll I'll start here, and I'm kind of I'm curious what you think of this. But I'll, I'm, uh, yeah. so I want to like you know I I gained a lot of respect for Nikita Zadorov this year when he came forward about his the russia ukraine thing i think took a lot of i think that took a lot of courage for him to speak out like that um and then nikita zadorov came out and called the team out essentially for not wanting to be there for players not wanting to be there um he took some flack for it um but for so for me but this is kind of like i i had you know, and but I also heard he wanted to stay in Calgary. He loved the city. He loved the team. He loves the organization. So I was stunned, quite frankly, to hear about this trade request because this is completely opposite to what Nikita Zadorov was saying or claiming. And I feel like he comes across out of this like a little bit of a hypocrite. So he was able to call out his own teammates and challenge them to look in the mirror but when the fact of the matter is this was a trade request that he wanted this can't comes out not from Nikita Zadorov this comes out from the agent and we hear from Zadorov after the Ottawa game this is that he let his agent do his business what this is what is confusing to me okay fine you want your agent to do your business and you're okay with whatever your agent is going to do you knew damn well that this this was going to come out 
before the Toronto game. You clearly didn't talk to the Calgary Flames organization nor the players in the dressing room about this trade request. And then you barely are able to stammer out that you wanted to request a trade when the cameras are in front of you. So if you're gonna call out your teammates and you're gonna make this bravado statement about being a better teammate, you better damn well be a good teammate. And Nikita Zadorov was not a good teammate. Um, and I'm really disappointed in him and how this was handled. Um, and I don't think he needed to go public with this because the Flames would probably would likely trade him by the trade deadline anyway. Yeah, it, this is one of those things where, um, frankly, there's a lot wrong with this team. And like, I, how, how would you say it? I thought that Zadorov earlier in the year when he called out his teammates um, was a good veteran leadership play because, frankly, finally somebody, you know, like this team has really lacked somebody, you know, bitching out this team since the Aginla era and early Aginla era. And, you know, like everybody's been a little bit too polite, I think. And... You know, uh, him calling out the team was the correct call. And then we saw that the team really didn't respond at all. And, like, the veteran players that were struggling that have struggled all season have pretty much, with except of uh, Mackenzie Wigger and Nazem Kadri, like, none of them have really stepped up in any measurable way. So it's one of those where, you know, like, he's frustrated too. And... Like, I can understand him wanting a trade. And it it's one of those where, you know... It's, it's like okay the, to want a trade. I, I, it, yeah. You know what? Like, it, it really... I, I think going into this year, we knew that this was going to be a conversation at some point. Without not only Zidora, but a number of Flames players. We, yeah. we knew this coming in. But it's the way that this was handled, after, I, I think that this is, you know... I think this was kind of poorly handled on Zadorov's part. And, you know, yes, there, he's he's making, he's trying to put this as, well, Milstein is the business guy, but he's you got to answer to the locker room. And you know, again, you're going through this Toronto game, and, you know, it's not fair to Craig Conroy to get this trip up on here, you know, that he's kind of... No. And it's not fair no. to the organization. <laughs> and really, the person I feel the worst for right now is Michael Backlund. Here's this new new captain. Well, and not here's, here's this guy having to wear the C for this organization. He's put his heart and soul in not only to this organization, but to the Cal the city of Calgary. And he's having to deal with this crap from Zadorov after he I don't know, like maybe you think that this was a good thing, Matt, but I don't know if that resonated yeah, well. Well with No, and how would you say like it, it is a slap in the face to the rest of the team. But frankly, um, they kind of deserve it as well. And, you know, like it, you see a bunch of players that are just playing for themselves with no, like nobody's actually pulling any weight together towards actually doing a damn thing. And, you know, you see other teams that actually seem to have a concept of how to actually play like a team. And, you know, like Zadorov is being pragmatic in saying, well, there is literally nobody here that is actually stepping up. Because nobody has, really. Other than Kadri and Uyghur, like, where is anybody else? Like, Dubé has played terribly. Manjapane is approaching a buyout candidate. You know, and uh, Mange, the rest of the Anjapani was leading the team in scoring. It, yeah, uh, and... I'll look at the stats here while you're chatting. <laughs> yeah, he is, but still, like he has not been very good either. And like none of the rest of the guys are showing anything at all. Like the only guys that are actually playing well are Pospisil, Zari, and the, their line mates. That's it. And it's hard, uh, you know, being pragmatic and wanting to actually be successful and have your efforts actually matter, you know, and you see the rest of your teammates not seeming to care at all. And, you know, like, I don't blame him. Like if it was me, I would want out of this team too. And it's yeah, not... okay. But how, how he handled this isn't the best. Oh, I agree. 
it, no, and it's not the best way, but it's also, uh, how would you say, trying to force, you know, change, some change to happen because, like, frankly, this team has a huge amount of rot throughout the organization, and you just need to start clearing out what's not working. And, you know, it's one of those things that, frankly, you need somebody to be blunt and hit people in the face and say, wake up. And, you know, well, like, I don't... Had that. The Flames yeah. had that. And this, the, 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 some people in the fan base laughed at the people that were doing it. There were, uh, was Trevor Lewis, Milan Lucic, Eric Gabranson, and a lot yeah. of them... But fan base, there's some in this fan base that was, <laughs> and I actually think Milan Lucic has looked pretty good in a Boston Bruin jersey. Trevor yep. Lewis looking good in a Los Angeles King jersey, and the Columbus Blue Jackets may not be very good. But I'll remind everybody, when Rasmus Ass Anderson took that unnecessary hit on Patrick Laine, who was the first person that walked in and stood up to Rasmus Anderson? Yep, it was Eric Gabranson. Oh, I know. Like, it, honestly, if it was me and it being in Craig Conroy's uh, role, I would actually, you know, sit down with Sidorov and hammer out a long-term contract extension and kind of turn the team over to him a after, you know, shedding other players because that is the right, like, how would you say, the um, the necessity for this team to be actually accountable to each other is vital for any good team moving forward. And, you know, like Zadorov is one of the key players that this team has that actually does that. And, you know, when he looks around the room and sees nobody else actually doing a damn thing, you know, it, it's tough because... You know, like, it's hard to cycle out 20 players. And, you know, the Flames are going to be beginning the process of actually clearing out some of that this year and over the next few years. Yeah, uh, I guess I, here's where maybe I'm not going to defend Zadorov's action, but I think one of Zadorov's um, comments has been about ice time and Matt, let's throw out a guess here. Who has the worst plus minus of all the Flames defense on this team? Which, by the way, includes, when I say this, I'm going to give spoil this. It is not Jordan Osterley, and it is not Dennis Gilbert. Well, I'd probably go with Zadorov. It is Noah Hannafin. At ah. minus Zadorov is minus six, but Noah Hannafin, the man that is demanding a contract himself this offseason as a UFA has six points, yes, but is a minus eight. So I think as Zadorov, I think that there is an argument if from Zadorov camp that he's played better than Noah Hannafin. I yeah. mean, he is, he is a chaos giraffe at best, Nikita Zadorov. At times, you don't know what you're going to get. I mean, that's been the obvious identity. But I kind of want to say this about Noah Hannafin, and this is probably going to be in a minority unpopular. I don't know what I'm going to get from Noah Hannafin either. I think that that's part of the reason that they put Hannafin with Chris Tanev, because he, he's he's not the, the obvious chaos giraffe that Nikita Zadorov is. Yeah. But boy, there's been a lot of times I've seen him at a position. Like oh, I know. I, like, there are times he's in position and he looks wonderful, and when he's on, he's on. But when he's off, I... It, it is kind of scary to be honest with you. Yeah. Well, and that's one of the things that is good about this season for the Flames. And frankly, their poor start is a good thing long term because, you know, like you're not locking yourself into eight years of Elias Lindholm and eight years of Noah Hannafin. And, you know, instead, you know, as much as it's as it's going to suck to have the growing pains of some of the younger players coming up, whether that's Soloviev or, um, you know, Kuz, uh, Kuznetsov or Poirier later on in the year when he gets better, you know, like this team, I think just needs to start, 
changing out the deck chairs and you know approach free agency with a bunch of money and you know try and change the team up and you know come at it again in a different way because certain players like Hannafin have just been okay not great not completely embarrassingly bad but you know, like it, it's one of those where the writing's kind of on the wall that this team just needs to shake things up all the way around. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's get to the Ottawa game, which kind of, yep. I think, bridges us into this. So on the bus, when the, the Ottawa game happens, the Flames got off to a good start, outshot the, the uh, Senators um, in the first period didn't wasn't rewarded for it good game from Jonas Corposalo um but this was also the debut of Dustin Wolf and this the way I saw this game is the Flames had you know there was a lot of offensive opportunities a lot of criticism about we'll get to Dustin Wolf in a second but let's, let's kind of to toss his back to Huberto for a moment and talk about deck chairs and um there was a lot of um criticism on Jonathan Huberto's breakaway opportunity and that he didn't bury it. It looked like a poor effort. I just, like, for me, when I saw it, I think what he was like, going down, I don't think he saw the room that everyone else saw in the replay when he was looking at Corpus Allo. I think he, he, the best he could do was get a shot off. Um, and I think he probably felt that defenseman that was behind him was a lot closer than maybe he actually was looking back. Um, so it's, I think it's easy sometimes to criticize on, on, on the replay, but that's kind of what I thought when I saw, uh, but I thought just thought in this game overall, there were too many times that the flames went lengthy periods without shots. Like it was a nine, 10 minute time between the first and the second without a shot and the first half of the third, um, there was, a, there was a length of time without a shot. Um, the penalty kill was good, although I thought Blake Coleman and Elias Lindholm took two very bad penalties back to back there. Um, but it, so the play in front of Dustin Wolf, I thought was inconsistent, and Ottawa was deserving of the win. Oh, I agree. Uh, Calgary looked very listless, kind of like the outdoor game where, you know, a little bit of effort in some parts of the game and then long stretches of nothing in other parts and you know uh it it's a shame that wolf's uh, season debut kind of got ruined by the effort in front of him but you know giving up four goals uh, you know it, that's going to happen to any goaltender when they're facing having a team that's not really doing anything <laughs> you know yeah, like, as know. much as like uh the uh Zadorov trade request was kind of supposed to be like a wake up call to everybody else. Um, they responded by lying down, frankly, and being even worse. <laughs> yeah, do you? I I think that there was it, it. It seemed in some places that there was a possibility. Well, Zadorov specifically on the three one goal, he made a bad play in terms of like that yeah. capability in front. So. You know, he, I didn't think he had a great game considering all that was in front of him. I think the team looked a little distracted overall. But I'm gonna, I want to kind of stick to the positive here because I, I actually really did like Dustin Wolf. Just the way he looked. He looked composed. Uh, yeah, he looked, like you can tell that this guy's going to be a good one for a long yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. I, I see why... And I, I, it's never been for me that I've not seen that he's been an NHL goalie. Yeah, it's, same here. It, 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 it's just, I think there's so many other, I my jitters are Carter Hart. My jitters are, quite frankly, maybe even a little bit of Stuart Skinner. Like just, in, and I'm not comparing them, but I, I'm always worried about, about that. But he certainly stepped up to the point that I would actually give him Montreal. Uh, I would start him in Montreal over Vladar. Yeah, same here. Second game. And I would consider, if that goes well, giving him the Vancouver game as well. I would go on a run, a little bit of a run with Wolf and see what he could do. Yeah, I agree. And uh, it's one of those where, 
this is where having two good veteran goalies helps to foster Vladar a bit, or Wolf, I mean. Um, if you're allowed allowing him to get some regular starts, but having that veteran presence, whether you trade off marks from or Vladar as the season goes on and have the other guy kind of uh, stewarding Wolf into the starter position over the next couple of years, I think that's the ideal situation, uh, sort of like how Nashville played it when they had Pekka Rene and UC Soros together, where they just let Rene kind of run out his NHL career while being the starter and allowing Soros to get an increasingly larger amount of games. So that way, by the time so, uh, Rene was done, Soros took over and Soros is one of the best goalies in the NHL. Yep. Yeah, and I think that this that it's I was just thinking about this now, uh, Matt. I Markstrom hasn't been hurt in two years, and Markstrom has been a frequently injured goalie. I I think that the Flames wondered a little bit if there's there was going to be some health concerns with Markstrom. And I think that they told Wolf, look, you're going down, but it's a possibility that we're gonna have a goaltender injury here and you're gonna play. Um, yeah. Oh, no, no. Even like in, in Dan and uh, my uh, season predictions thread or comment section, uh, we talked about Wolf playing 10, 15, 20 games this year, even with the other two guys uh, being in the lineup still. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, I, I mean, I wouldn't, I think I wouldn't be surprised if we see Wolf at least once this week, even twice yeah. this week. Um, so, that was uh, that was pretty much the games um, in terms of what happened. I mean, I think a couple of other things just to, I guess, to kind of, I, you know, I, I forgot to put this on the agenda, but I want to have this conversation a little bit, Matt, about Elias Lindholm. And then I want to talk a little bit about uh, Mike Burn. I also forgot about Mike Vernon too, and I think we should acknowledge that. Yeah. Too. Uh, but let's let's start on Lindholm here. I think, as I said, I think he's struggling. I think that I, is is it possible that he needs a change of scenery? Sure, yes. Um, I, there there was a lot of talk about you know when Gaudreau and Kachuk left that you know i don't think we there was a lot of talk about how it impacted the team i don't know if we talked about how this would have impacted lindholm himself and i think he's been through a very difficult time the last year and a bit you've had you've lost your line mates um you, the line mate that you were supposed to have uh, success with you didn't end up having success with um you do feel that you've been undervalued in terms of your league salary all over. Um, I think there's a lot of the world is, I feel like I, there's, there's people differing with me on this one for sure, but I feel Elias Lindholm is a good hockey player that is playing with an unbelievable piano on his shoulder. And yeah. I think it's really hard for him right now. And if you're going to no. have sympathy for Jonathan Huberto after his benching, I think that you, Elias Lindholm, deserves some similar sympathy for the, what he's been through as well. Oh, I agree. And it's one of those where it, it's frustrating because, you know, like it wasn't his fault that his line mates left. And it just, you know, and he's been trying to find chemistry again. It's hard when you're not, uh, meshing with another person and you know like things just aren't working because you try harder the other guy tries harder and when it still doesn't work then you know like everybody's gripping their sticks too hard and then you know choking on easy plays like the overtime game in toronto and you know it's one of those things that as much as it's disappointing that the best thing for him, I think is finding his way onto a new team to get a fresh start. Uh, you know, and it, you know, I don't like seeing him move on. I actually like Lindholm a lot as a player, but, uh, you know, it's one of those where like, if he had signed the eight year, $9 million, whatever contract that was 
that presented to him in the off season, uh, like that would have been perfectly okay in my books. But you know, it, as the season is progressing, the like that kind of an offer makes no sense anymore. And you know, it's more like, well, maybe just change for change sake is the better option for both sides on this. And you know, it sucks, but you know, when your team is vastly underperforming, you kind of have to be forced into making things happen that you don't necessarily planned or intend on doing. Yeah. You know, last year, people, for all the criticism that Lindholm got, which, you know, was fair. He, when the Flames won, Elias Lindholm was a point of game player with a plus 20 in the plus minus. And I, I mean, Take plus minus for what you will. Um, this, I'm just looking up this year. Um, last five games, he's got two points. I'm um, just going through here. Hang on. Uh, through, uh, I'm looking, trying to look at the stats here. Yeah, like he had three points in the first game, which was a win against Winnipeg. He had his, his the game against Dallas on the 1st of November. He had two points. He hasn't had a point since. He's had a point in one, two, three, four, five games this year um, and two multi-point games. Uh, yeah, it just, it isn't, he, it's not working for him. Um, but, and I think, I think, yeah, I, 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 I think the Flames need to find a way to get the weight of the world off his shoulders, and I hope he prospers in whatever whatever he does, because I've always believed that Elias Lindholm was a damn good player, but and yeah. with not, you know, I know a lot of people are going to say just because it was both Johnny and, and Matt and Matthew Chuck that he got that selkie, I think he earned it in and of itself. I think he's been a guy, I, I still think he's a damn good hockey player. Um, and I think he will succeed in wherever he goes. Oh, I agree. And that's where I think like this player will have a market of 31 teams um, looking for his services. It's just a matter of finding the right situation for him and the right return. And yeah. that's where like a return with uh, Johnny and Columbus might make a lot of sense just due to the fact that Columbus has a dearth of really good young players and young prospects and you know good draft picks so you know they're trying to get Gaudreau going after him struggling for a while too so yeah we'll see. um i i still don't th i still don't think this will happen but let's just throw this out here Gaudreau coming back to calgary for jonathan huberto I honestly would not mind that for one reason only. One year less, one million dollars less. Yeah. And I think I think Johnny I think if you put Johnny if Johnny ever writes a book, he's, he's gonna regret what happened in Calgary for sure. Yeah. He left. Um and I don't I think he's not I, I think he put himself in a position to not succeed. Yeah, he literally shot himself in the foot. Like, yeah. uh, you know, like there was no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Like, frankly, like he could have retired a god here, basically. Yeah. On the in the same conversation with Flurry and Aginla, and instead he's going to be rem remembered as basically the modern version of Kent Nelson. Yeah. Which you know, which like okay, good for you, and you know, like if he came back, sure. Uh, I personally would not go out of my way to go for that. But, you know, if it meant dumping Huberto's contract and nothing against Huberto himself, uh, at this point, it's just contract wise, you know, just getting the extra year off uh, and the million dollars cheaper for Goudreau, like that would be worth it just for that. Yeah. My other worry, though, is I don't think Kikulani can make a trade right now. I think he is handcuffed in terms of after that Mike Babcock fiasco. I oh, think, yeah. I think and he, other than the general manager we will talk about in a moment here, he is his seat in the general manager chair is the hottest probably in the National Hockey League right yeah. now. But. And I, on a, you know, honestly, I've thought that Kekalainen has done really well with Columbus, considering that it's Columbus and the parameters of 
you know, basically being in a the America's version of Edmonton, <laughs> you know, to be blunt, um, where like no nobody's going. Oh, I want to go play in Columbus. You know, like nobody other than Gaudreau ever has been enthusiastic like that for Columbus and yeah it's one of those where like considering all of that I think that the Blue Jackets have done extremely well under Kekalainen it's just that uh, Babcock couldn't you know stop being himself and yeah yeah um Speaking of gods and legends and all of that, uh, the, this weekend and uh, Monday, Mike Vernon will be officially inducted into the Calgary in the National Hockey League Hall of Fame. Um, and did the Flames are the Flames doing anything about like I know they retired his number and gave him a ceremony a long time ago, but it really feels like they have. I mean, they're honoring Mika Kiprasov this year, but they're not. Do they have any plans for Mike Vernon? not that i'm aware um yeah it, i am a little baffled by that myself like you would think that they'd have some sort of big hubbub about him entering the hall of fame and perhaps they might have a ceremony before the next home game but uh we'll see i i don't know frankly yeah it is a little it, it's, yeah it seems out of place like he should have that but we'll see i i think you know i think he he did get a his the end of the mike vernon era in calgary didn't go well but he did get the you know that 11 it was an 11 game losing streak back in 1986 and a little young goaltender not unlike a dustin wolf came in and saved the day saved the season for 1986 and that was mike vernon of course he was the goalie that got the flames to the final in 86 um in 1989 in that first round of the playoffs against the canucks there was a massive upset if it were not for uh mike vernon save on both tony's tanty and stan smeal there would that team would have looked that the history of this organization would look a lot different so i think vernon does deserve his his respect and of course he did have a second run with the flames of course before well, yeah 99 2000 yeah but so um i hope they i hope they I, the flames fans I, I i would just encourage you like this this isn't you know <laughs> I still would say probably Kiprasov was the better overall goalie, but Mike Vernon contributed to this organization and he deserves, he deserves his recognition for sure. And I hope that the Flames do something to honor him because he deserves that standing ovation for getting into the Hall of Fame. Oh, I agree. And, you know, like when it, it came out that he was getting inducted, I'm like, well, that's about damn time. Yeah. Like he should have been inducted in my books about 10 years ago, but you know at, at least he finally has joined the group of all the other really top tier goaltenders in nhl history and you know like up until recently he was in the top 10 and wins all time like you know you have to be pretty damn good regardless of what teams you're playing on to get into that stratosphere of goaltender yeah yeah he, he deserves he deserves the recognition and hopefully the flames the Flames organization and the Flames fans have that opportunity to do that. In terms of with the Flames specifically, do we have anything else that we need to chat about? Uh, not really. Other than uh, I just want to throw this out um, moving forward uh, because like uh, the Florida Panthers are my second favorite team and have been pretty much since uh, they came in the league. And seeing uh, Jonathan Huberdo. And uh, the recent call-up of Martin Pospisil. Pospisil is the only guy on the Flames team that is the type of player that Huberdeau actually meshes with, uh, where Pospisil always is driving the net constantly and getting mucking it up with the goaltenders. That is one thing I'd like to see tried out moving forward, is Huberdeau with Pospisil, just to see if that chemistry could work, because... 
just for style of player, that is the type of guy that Huberdo likes working with the most. I think this guy, I mean, we talked about he may be a fourth line winger last week. I don't, I'm the way more I watch him, I see a lot more of that upside. Yeah, it, it, he's impressed me since uh, getting the recall. Like, I, I saw a little bit of this kind of thing in uh, Stockton a bit and then with the Wranglers a bit. But, like, he seems to, like, now that he's injury-free and actually getting on a roll of things, you're starting to see more of his actual game emerge. And, you know, that's why I'm curious to see if there's might be more there there. Uh, because, he, you know, the, the archetype of all, of all the players that Huberto's ever worked well with is exactly the type of style that Pospisil brings. So you know it it might be a weird marriage that works and you know like i don't think anybody penciled zari in with kadri and sharon govich to start the year but you know that seems to be working like gangbusters thus far yeah yeah you know back to that was you know that was interesting just back to the huberdo benching the that one picture that i will take away not only the forlorn look that Con the jonathan huberdo had but just right beside him was was Connor Zeri drinking his water. He kind of had his back towards Huberdo, and I I mean I don't think that that was intentional on Zeri's part, but that looked like a guy that was a complete confident and ready to go National Hockey League player. Yeah, I I, I think that that is it just was a, just an interesting juxtaposition, and maybe the position that the Flames are in in this. I'll throw the word transition period in, you know, where we're seeing a little bit more of a youth idea here. The R word uh, without using the R word. <laughs> yeah, that's, there he is. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, well, I, I, I kind of think just we'll wait and see over that. Wait and see um, where this team is. I, I think when I, 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 I mean, I, I, do the Flames need to rebuild? Yes. I think what I'm, where I'm, I've been pushing back, and I, I'll just reiterate what I've been saying before. There's a difference between rebuilding and tanking and intentionally losing. And 0% of professional sports teams that have actually went into tank intentional lose mode have actually been successful in rebuilding a franchise to a consistent win. See Edmonton and Buffalo and yeah. Arizona. Like yeah. those three teams tanked hard for years. And like, there's still all three of them are garbage. Yeah. Speaking yeah. of that, you have a way of a transition, Matt. Yep. <laughs> what a week it was with Edmonton. Well, first of all, you get well, we'll the, the most to... hilarious game of the last ten years. <laughs> yeah. Well, there was two hilarious games this week in in Edmonton land. The first funny game was the one in Vancouver where they started off night out shooting the Canucks 19 to two in the first period and three goals in three minutes on Stuart Skinner and the, the Oilers are all of a sudden down three, nothing uh, that goes to a six, two game, which included a Jay Woodcroft ejection, a Connor McDavid could have getting not one, not two, not three, but probably four penalties within three minutes, trying to get into a fight with JT Miller. Um, trying to get into a fight with Sam Lafferty um, and just to complete and Darnell nurse losing it a as well. So that was game one of the hilarity moment. Game two of the hilarity moment was they yeah. played San Jose Sharks and probably the one that I think everybody is laughing hardest at. Well, is and like the San Jose Sharks for anybody who's not paying attention are basically one of the all time worst teams in NHL history currently. They, like they are they're, certainly going, going down. Yeah, you know, they're, they're shooting for that record. Like they're bad on yeah. a level that's really unprecedented in the last 30 years. Like you have to go all the way back to the 92 93 San Jose Sharks, coincidentally, for a team that was just this spectacularly awful. Yeah. It, and then they beat the Oilers. <laughs> yeah. And they beat the Oilers three to two. But then the Oilers play Seattle on Saturday night and don't allow 20 shots. They got out to a four nothing lead. They beat the Kraken four to one. And this morning, uh, Sunday morning, for those that are not listening on the day, Jay Woodcroft is fired and Dave Manson is fired. 
And of course, the one of the photos that are pictures that go um, is going to be forever etched in internet memory is the Dave Vance and Saint J, J. Woodcroft. I think we're done, basically. Our Dave Manson asking, are we done? And Jay Woodcroft saying, yes. Turns out that they were right. Replaced with Connor McDavid's junior hockey coach, Chris Knobloch, who was coaching in Hart the New York Rangers org organization with Hartford. And Paul Coffey is going from whatever job he had in the Edmonton organization to behind the bench. Um, the circus continues. It is. This is an. I, I. I. This is. First of all, like I actually like Jay Woodcroft. I think he's a good coach. I think he's a guy that should land on his feet rather quickly. And I think. Yeah, I actually him. have been surprised with him. I didn't like him at the start. I thought he was way in over his head, and he actually surprised me by being an effective coach. But honestly, like frankly, the Oilers needed Daryl Sutter of I know, or that you. type where somebody to come in and just kick everybody's ass and you know the like they need it because you know like as much as like we complain about the flames being a bunch of individuals like that they're on like a completely different planet of individuality than the flames where like there is no team there is Connor mcdavid leon dreisaitl and 18 other people and yeah like it's embarrassingly bad well, and this was, there was a couple of really good tweets uh, today. One was from Ryan Pinder that pointed out that the new CEO was Connor McDavid's agent, Jeff Jackson. Uh, the big free agent signing of the offseason was Connor McDavid's junior winger, Connor Brown. And he is not, I haven't, has he played? Like, I've really, haven't seen him. Like, I think if he's played, he's played very sparingly. He doesn't seem to be in the middle of anything. And now you bring in Connor McDavid's coach. Um, it makes you wonder who's running the, this organization or why they're trying to cater to Connor McDavid so much. Um, well, and frankly, I think that the honest answer is that um, next, at the end of next season, I think that Leon Dreisaitl, if he isn't traded, is going to walk. And I think that Connor McDavid will probably end up following him out the door because. You know, like they've had how many years now? Eight that uh, since they've had the two of them, and they've had build. five coaches. This yeah. will be their and, fifth coach. And you know, you look at Crosby, and you know the having him and Malkin on the team. That you know, the Penguins had enough there there to find the other parts that they needed, and they ended up going on and winning the Stanley Cup, and then two more. A few years later other teams like colorado when they got mckinnon it took them a little bit longer but they got there ovechkin got his cup you have two the two best scorers in the nhl together the edmonton oilers should already have two or three stanley cups if they were built correctly but nobody realized in that organization that hey there are 18 other people not just those two guys and you know and you're starting to see like their reliance on dry and mcdavid and playing them 28 29 minutes a night is starting to cause them to not be very good now and like mcdavid has not looked good at all this season before the injury or since and dry has been fairly pedestrian for him and you know playing them as much as they did only has a short lifeline of being able to get away with that before you literally run them into the ground you know like it's looking like everything's just gonna implode on edmonton very shortly if it's not already in the middle of doing so yeah i i to me that this was the, it was fascinating to me that there a lot of people had the oilers believing that the oilers will catch vegas like here are some questions that I went like look, just looking back for the, the people that believed in the Oilers. What evidence did you have that they were an honest Stanley Cup contender that were close? To uh, I know, uh, like Matias Matias Ekholm is a decent defenseman, 
but he is not going to win you a Stanley Cup by himself. And frankly, well, the and Edmonton... that's a ba- that's quite frankly, Matt, that was actually a really bad trade that nobody is talking about. Tyson oh, Berry has a better plus minus stat, has better stats right now than Matthias Eckholm. And I yeah, think well, Luke is going to turn out to be a damn good player. And you gave up a first on no, a team that has not drafted well the last, really not great. I mean, Evan, you could argue that Evan Bouchard is working out, but I think Evan Bouchard is playing way over his head right now. I don't think yeah. he is. I think he should be a five, six, four defenseman, and they are playing him in, in a top two role, and he's not ready for it. No, I agree. And they did kind of the same thing with Darnell Nurse. Yep. Throwing him up in the lineup. Who, and, who's getting paid $9 you know, million. Oh, I know. For basically being a $3 million defenseman, if not yep. lower than that. And. No, and it, it's – well, Edmonton, frankly, like, you have to go, like, for getting, like, second-round picks and beyond, like, just – you have to go practically back to Jeff Petrie to find anybody that they actually developed that was their own guy. Vincent DeHarnay uh, is probably the only one that you can say. Yeah, okay, yeah. And, like, that's a long stretch, though. Like, Petrie was drafted in, like, 2008 or something like that like you know and that's for second round and beyond like that's like a decade plus of picks and getting absolutely nothing well no wonder your team is not doing well you know like you actually need second third fourth line guys like you know like if basically the flames and the oilers have opposite problems like if you you put mcdavid and dry on our team and you know take out the first line and just keep the rest like that team instantly is the best team in the NHL, but it it's one of those where, like the Oilers have zero depth at all, and you know you're starting to see, you know that, like they are a paper tiger and always have been, and because the top two are great, but you have nothing else. Yeah, you got you. I mean, I've always liked Zach Hyman, but if I mean. You know, um, and I've always liked Ryan Nugent. I think those two are solid. But after that, um, your their best bottom six forward has been Warren Fogle. Derek Ryan has been nowhere near the Derek Ryan that he was in Calgary. Um, and you got Adam Early. You got Sam Gagne, who, like, a lot of these guys are kind of in the last legs. And you just, like, and they haven't been able to field a quality with the salary cap problems that they're having, they can't, they can barely put 20 players on the ice. I just think there's so much work to do. And it was, this was not on Woodcroft. Um, No. And it's one of those where like, I think that anybody uh, looking at uh, the Oilers as like a cup contender was being blinded by the fact that McDavid and Drysdale are two of the best players in the NHL and not seeing like systematically like if you take those two guys out like they're the worst team in the league and like now that those two guys are not playing quite as well they're right near the bottom where they should be and it's frustrating to see because you know like the last thing that Edmonton needs is another number one overall pick to get you know and try and ruin but you know it, it's one of those things that like i think the in the next few years that's going to be their destiny again as being a basement team that has to hope to get another super talent guy like mcdavid and i i honestly don't see him sticking around or dry you know yeah, much like zadorov having enough of his team being you know like nobody actually pitching in you know like it must be frustrating for those two looking at like basically all the stars from around the NHL vying for Stanley cups. And here they are toiling in the basement, you know, literally wasting their career on a deadbeat team. Yeah. I, it's, yeah, it, it's, it's really, it's, it's quite a mess there. Um, and it's just, it's just like, I, I there was a lot of talk on uh, the social media I think today that putting McDavid in this coaching killer position and I I'm not sure I buy no. that. This is no, yeah. This is literally it was the owner down level yeah. problem. Like this isn't a team problem. This is a ownership general manager problem. And 
you know, like being stuck in the past, looking at the Oilers of the eighties where, yeah, they could go just go out and score seven goals in a game because they had an all-star team. Yeah, sure. That's one way of doing it. But, you know, since then teams have actually learned that how to play defense and, (laughs) you know, the Oilers have never actually like through all the eras since then have never really other than the one year they had Chris Pronger have not a- actually focused on team defense whatsoever. And like, they have been terrible since, you know, the last Stanley cup they had and like they, they need to actually get with the times that, you know, you actually have to have 20 players that are competent players in the NHL, not just relying on your handful of superstars and, Oh, well, we'll just outscore the other team. Like it just doesn't work like that anymore. Yeah, yeah. They 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 continue to they continue to struggle on on the things that allow you to win, and yeah. that you know um, they will always compete for the Art Ross Trophy. But the object of this of this exercise is to win the Stanley Cup, and until they actually figure that out, they're not going anywhere. Yeah. Well, and, you know, to contrast uh, number one overall from 2016 to, or 2015 uh, with uh, number two, Jack Eichel, um, you know, he struggled mightily with a similarly bad franchise, then finally got dealt and pretty much instantaneously picked up some silverware. Yeah. And, you know, like, I, I'm sure that both Dreisaitl and McDavid are going, well, hey, he could do it. And in one of those quiet parts not said out loud, Matt, if you, I look, I always look back at that Vegas Oilers series. Jack Eichel outplayed Connor McDavid. And not oh, yeah. by this much. It was no. a significant margin that oh, Jack yeah. Eichel outplayed Connor McDavid. Yeah. I would eat honestly. I would actually take Eichel over McDavid at this point, and because Eichel actually plays defense, and yeah, yeah, I think Eichel will be in the conversation this year. Yeah, like you look at like Alex Ovechkin, like for years he was basically what McDavid and Drysaddle are, until he had that meeting with Wayne Gretzky to ask him, "Well, how the heck do I actually, you know, because our team always loses in the first round? Why is that?" And then, oh, well, you actually have to play responsible defensively and lead by example. Ovechkin changed his game. The the Capitals win the Stanley Cup. And, you know, until McDavid and Dreisaitl figure that out too, like, yeah. you know, like it, it, defense wins championships it, in all sports. And, you know, it's a fairly basic thing. Like, you know, you can't get away with it. Like, it, it does not matter. Unless you're the 1980s Oilers where you have, like, five guys that are ridiculously talented where you can literally just score at will and who cares, you know, then you can get away with it. But that happens once, maybe in a sports history, where a team has that kind of a collection and then never again. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I... Yeah, it's it, it, it's, and this is again just to go back to the tankathon. This is your warning sign of what potentially could happen uh, when you are tanking. Is you have a losing mentality, and it is hard, hard, hard to get out of that. Oh yeah. Um, um you know, sure. You know, there's and the, the whole conversation about getting top three pick. Yeah, that's great. You. You would well, look. well do you, do you take a look at um, uh, Buffalo, for example, because uh, we mentioned the three of them, Edmonton and Arizona, struggling for so long. And it took until they got Rasmus Dahlin and then Owen Power, plus some of the other guys that they have on the blue line, to finally start to come out of that ditch where they learned that, oh, you actually have to play deep in defense in order to you know, you can have all the shiny scorers that you want, but you need the rest of the team to actually get forward. And now finally Buffalo is looking like they're starting to come out of it after being, you know, in the same pile since 2010. 
Well, and I think one thing that we, with the Flames, the last few years, just to bring this back to the Flames here as we're wrapping yeah. up, the Flames have done really well. Where One way area that the Flames have done really well and where the Oilers haven't is drafting in the mid, mid to late rounds successfully. Dustin mm-hmm. Wolf, seventh round. Andrew Mangiapane, fourth round. Johnny Gaudreau was a later round pick. Dylan yeah. Dubé was not a first round pick. And I know he's not playing well right now but he's a guy that has been in the nhl well um, even looking at like soloviev yeah. rasmus anderson oliver shillington like all of those guys were not first round draft picks and you know even you're looking at some of the flames top prospects uh Pedersen on the farm he's like a fourth or sixth round pick himself um poirier he was drafted in the third round um who's nets off he was drafted in the second round like you know and you can keep going through Clapco is a free agent like you know you're finding other ways of supplementing it, it's one of those like where you have it's important to hit your first rounders but you also need to hit on some of the depth guys too yeah you can't go home after the first round of the draft you can't say no, i got Connor Bedard and i'm going home now no, because like as much as like Connor Bedard's absolutely amazing for Chicago, you know, you look at the rest of the Blackhawks team and they're basically the same garbage team they were last year. Yeah. And like it's going to take them a couple of years, even with Connor Bedard, to even sniff the playoffs just because, you know, one guy, even as ridiculously talented as Bedard is, cannot drag a team to the playoffs by himself. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so it's certainly interesting. Um, yeah, it's very interesting yeah. times in Alberta for sure. Yeah, you know? well, that's where you know you look at teams around the league, and it's like, hmm, who has a lot of draft picks, <laughs> and how many of our guys can we trade there? Hey, Arizona has ten second round draft picks in the next three years. Let's go for them. <laughs> uh, well, even the Kraken. Yeah, there's there are some yeah. teams that you can make some moves with for sure. So it's, yeah. it is fascinating, but. Well, especially like with the Flames being in the situation they are, because they have been so effective over the last like six, seven, eight years of getting those good guys from the second round and beyond, getting just additional draft picks, uh, you know, and having more bullets in the chamber to try and hit the target, you know, like that is what's going to make this team, you know, into a contender again is being able to get as many of those draft picks and actually capitalizing on them moving forward. Well, and I also, you know, just, I think for the city and I think I, one of the things that I think also would be good is, is a run, a run of the playoffs for the Calgary Wranglers. And, you know, it would, we would be remiss to point out no Dustin Wolf, uh, no Connor Zary, and they beat the San Diego Golds this week, 12 to four, 12 to two. Um, so this is a team that, you know, you look at the Wranglers, there's- Well, they're the best team in the league. Yeah. Yeah. I think they're eight, one and one now or something like that. Like they're gangbusters right now. Yeah, yeah, they are. So. I mean, yeah, you got like a good playoff run or a championship run, I think would do good for the city. It would do good for the market, um, for the Wranglers as well. So, uh, yeah, I think, I think that yeah. just, you know, with all the darkness around the flames right now and all the kind of the gloom and doom, a good Wrangler playoff run, I think would help. Uh, yeah. Let's see here, I'm just looking at the standing. And I just want to mention uh, one one thing about uh, the Flames drafts over the last few years. Um, for a while, they weren't really drafting a ton of defensemen because uh, they were for- focusing on getting more forwards, which made sense at the time. But um, the last few years, they've been getting a, a quite a little stockpile of really top-notch defensemen coming up uh Soloviev looks like a really decent third pairing defenseman uh soon to be in the nhl like the couple of games he played he did not look out of place um jeremy poirier was drafted as basically an all offense no defense guy but uh he's learned how to play defense too um emile moran or etienne moran uh the flame second rounder for from this past year is going to be a monster for this team he hits like a bus and he can 
then score on you while your body's laying on the ice. <laughs> so, you know, he is a dynamo and he he honestly is my favorite pick from the Flames over the last 5 years, Moran. Um so like the Flames do have a good crop of young guys coming up. So, you know, like it's one of those like where like they will need to add more and like especially if they can get some more draft picks and things through free agency and trade, but uh you know it, it's one of those they already have a good foundation ready to go so you know it's not like they're starting from square one on that front yeah, yeah that's fair that's fair and then darren haynes pointed that out as well on on the x as well uh two other things that just i should we should mention before we wrap up here matt uh we didn't mention that dryden hunt was placed on waivers cleared waivers on the same day that jack campbell was placed on waivers uh, so he's back with the wranglers um, I would suspect that we don't see Dryden Hunt back with the Flames this year. Um, I think he gave it the old college try, as Dan would say, but I think that he, I think he's more suited to the AHL game than the NHL game. Yeah, he's really like your prototypical filler guy if you need just a body. Yeah. And, you know, if not, then he can just go lead the AHL team uh, to more success. Because he's he is a serviceable middle six guy in uh, the AHL, so yeah. Um, and unfortunately, there was a passing this weekend. Uh, Samuel Murray, a goaltending coach back with the uh, Vancouver Giants, uh, passed away uh, here. Uh, he was part of the Memorial Cup team back uh back in, involved in team canada as well he passed away uh i could yesterday i believe here sorry i just want to give me one second here um but i just wanted to acknowledge before we closed out here wanted to acknowledge that i mean he's he did make an impact in the whl he did spend some time with team canada as well as a goaltending consultant so um he yeah, a very unfortunate news that he he passed away uh, uh, over the weekend here. So we just wanted to acknowledge that uh, here as well. Yeah, it's always hard when things like that happen. Um, like also today, uh, Roman Czechmanic, uh, former oh. Flyers and Kings goalie, passed away. Yes, so. that's right. That was another one that unfortunately passed away. Yeah, uh, when I saw that name, I it, it was the Flames had a Roman Czechmanic back a f- number of years ago that played center. Uh, Roman Trevenka. Trevenka, that's who. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he was a mediocre second, third line uh, forward for the one year, and then he went back to Europe. He was just too slow. <laughs> yes, that was a Jay Feaster signing, I believe. Yeah. He was a good player. He just was too slow for the NHL, and that was literally the only problem with him. Otherwise, he probably would still be in the NHL right now. Fair, yeah. Yeah, he had some skill. Uh, just trying to find... Okay. Uh, here, just give me one second here. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. Well, is there anything else while I'm looking at this, or looking this up, is there anything else we need to chat about uh not really um the thing i always try to focus on when you know seasons like this happen is that you know like as frustrating as it is like the last time the flames had a season that went off the rails like this uh was uh the 2015-2016 season and uh that ended up in the flames getting matthew kachuk in the first round so you know as much as it's tough to endure the team basically in a significant amount of turmoil, you know, at the end of the day, like, you know, it will get better and it's just a matter of enduring the short-term pain uh, until the flames can find their next star player. And, you know, they'll unfortunately come on draft day, either this year or next year or the year after. And, you know, just have to be kind of patient unfortunately yeah yeah it's it just it just take this one game at a time and you know well and, and the thing is is that um 
like the hardest uh, thing that uh, a lot of teams that go into like the complete teardown rebuilds tend to have is finding the good quality second, third, and fourth line guys and the depth defensemen. Because you can always draft the the star guy in the first round with your first overall pick. Uh, but, you know, like the Flames do have that solid crop of guys like Peltier and Zari and Coronado already, you know, in the NHL and ready to go. So, you know, like it's just a matter of getting additional guys to add on to that to turn the team over and carry on. Fair, yeah. By the way, it's not Sam Murray. My apologies. It was Sean Murray that passed away. Sean Murray that we have to give our condolences to. I, that's why I was stumbling around there because I was looking for Samuel. Was, his name was actually Sean Murray. Yeah. Anyway. Makes sense. Sean Murray, rest in peace, as well as Roman Chickmanic. Well, Matt, it was a good episode. Um, how, for the Firesiders, how do we follow you? Uh, on Twitter, um, Facebook, Instagram, I think, uh, YouTube, all at uh, firesidechat.ca. And um, firesidechat.ca is our website. So anywhere you can find your podcasts, we're pretty much there. Yeah, you can follow us the same way, Shifts and Pucks on X. Um, you can follow Sean, uh, Beardy Connect 03, Tyler TNOBLE, Chris Schneids, S C H N E I D Z. Devin Gordhau09, uh, I-M-K-E-V-O-L-E. We'll be, we cover both the Flames and the Canucks. We will be doing a Canucks-specific podcast probably Tuesday or Wednesday. I, I'm assuming that we haven't figured out the schedule. We'll post that. Um, we were try, we'll keep you abreast in terms of Flames scheduling. We're trying to just schedule that. We normally do that Thursdays, but I also am working th- the next couple of Thursdays, so we'll figure that out. So keep an eye out for that. But Matt, it was great to, to do this. It's great to chat and great to have a crossover episode. Yeah. And, Anytime. And how do you always end that, Matt? As always, go Flames Go. Thanks, everyone. We will talk to you all very soon. Bye for now. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.